Welcome back to the table. I'm Renee De Silva, CEO of the Health Management Academy and your host. To kick off our new season, I'm delighted to welcome Liz Bickley, the Chief Operating Officer of Corn Ferry Health. Corn Ferry released an updated Women CEO Speak Today report, which featured 21 conversations with companies in and out of healthcare who were led by women. My conversation with Liz was grounded in her team's research, and I highly recommend you give the full report a read. A few of my takeaways. First, some background. Today, more than 10% of Fortune 500 companies are led by women, which is a record high. And among S&P 500 companies, 29 board seats are held by women, which is important to note given that board service often provides critical experience, which sets new CEOs up for success. We acknowledge that much more progress is needed on racial equity. And really, we are only halfway to Corn Ferry and Rockefeller Foundation's broader goal of 100 women CEOs at Fortune 500 companies. We should still note that the progress has been encouraging. Next, one of my favorite parts of their report was the visualization of career paths. As we hear a lot today, there's no linear path, certainly not to the CEO position as I can personally attest to. Liz walks us through it all, their key findings, the background evolution, and further makes the point how oftentimes others instill belief and potential in us that we don't really see in ourselves. I've called that in the past, the power of the nudge. And finally, I loved Liz's advice for women leaders hoping to be a CEO, which is leverage your resilience, lead with purpose, and don't waste time in organizations who are not all in on supporting your career trajectory. I could have spent all day on this topic with Liz, and I hope you enjoy the discussion as much as I did. So with that, let's head to the table. Good morning, Liz. Welcome to the table. Good morning. Thank you for having me. So I um I first read Corn Ferry's work, your work on women CEOs speak today at the end of last year. And I've been eagerly waiting to have some time with you to unpack all of the, the findings in that. So thank you so much for joining us today. No problem at all. Before we dive in, I'm always curious about the guest and like to get a sense for their background. So maybe give us a sense for how you got into healthcare and then in particular, you're now in the chief operating officer role at Corn Ferry Health. How did that come to be? Yeah, so I come from a, a long family line of, of teachers. So a commitment to service, I think, has always existed. Um, it, that teaching gene skipped a generation. My sister and I both chose not to pursue that. Although, interestingly, my daughter is now training to be a, mm. a high school history teacher. Um, but that that's a commitment to service has always existed. Um, and I, as a young child, actually had a, a traumatic experience that was pretty formative for me. It gave me some visibility of the system of healthcare, the access or lack of access, and was always something that I was passionate about being able to make an impact to. Um, I've had the opportunity to spend time kind of inside and outside of the system. And I had a great coach and mentor who told me that I could have a, a greater and broader impact from the outside, which is really what's turned into my career of working in the consulting space with organizations like Corn Ferry. Um, and I really like to try and think about that, that pebble effect in a pond, although I'd like to think that perhaps we're throwing some rocks in the ocean and having yeah. that ripple effect of, of impacting Healthcare, care, access to care, and in particular, particular a focus around um, diversity and, and elevating the role that women and other diverse colleagues can play in the space. That's fantastic. And when you think about um, just zooming out on search, and I and I love your. It, maybe it feels like we're now throwing rocks in the ocean versus pebbles in the in, in the pond. When you think about just the, the the need for greater rigor around both talent recruitment and talent retention, just bring to life some of the conversations that you're having at a high level with the folks that you're working with across healthcare. Yeah, I think it's it's such an interesting concept. Uh, you and I discussed when we spoke that 
nobody is hiring themselves out of today's talent crisis. Mm -hmm. We particularly in healthcare know that there is not enough talent to go around and that that gap is going to continue to grow over the next couple of years. And that we really have just such a great opportunity to think not only about recruitment, but retention and mobility and moving away from career pathways to career rock walls, um, thinking about the opportunities that exist in automation and augmentation and what that can mean to work and the future of work that our, our colleagues and our healthcare partners need to do versus have to do today um, and make sure that all of that is ultimately impacting experience patient care and hopefully the utopia of outcomes. That's right. You know, so much of what you just mentioned, I I had some time with about eight health systems and their trustees last week. And, you know, the topic that dominates that conversation is all of what you just talked about. It's this notion that team members are really reimagining their compact with their employers. And for those of us that are hoping that we'll go back to what maybe it looked like in the past, like that is that is a non-starter. It's really about how do we reimagine the future and and how that that all plays out. So I, I think you've encapsulated that beautifully. I, I particularly loved your migrating from career pathways to career rock walls, this notion of new capabilities and just sort of thinking about how those might be applied differently. I think that's brilliant. Yeah, I think it's interesting because it's applied to to my own career you know I think about that it's been varied it's been scrappy (laughs) it's been ambitious Um, and when we talk in a little bit about our report on women CEO speaks you will see some of those consistencies in how we've seen those women who've been able to rise to the top um, take very different routes to get there Um, personally you know I I've never asked anyone to do anything that I'm not willing to do myself. Um, As my husband will attest, I'm fiercely independent (laughs) (laughs) and have always focused on kind of that impact and outcomes, both on behalf of my client partners, but also the teams that I'm working with. Um, I'm a huge advocate for, for women at work. I've been willing to personally, again, kind of take risks, push outside of my comfort zone Um, and have tried to apply that wherever I've worked around the world, whether that's, you know, the north of England, North America, um, India, and the Middle East, and and apply some of that philosophy. I love that. So let's dive into the report, because there is so much to unpack. So the first report on advancing women to the CEO role, you all, Corn Ferry produced that in 2017. You followed up late last year by interviewing 21 women CEOs, both in and out of healthcare, which I think is worth noting, and many of whom were serving in their positions in Fortune 500 companies. I think it was more than 10% of Fortune 500 companies are now led by women. So with that backdrop, what are your your, your top takeaways? Where have we seen the most progress, um, even in that duration of 2017, when you all first published to 2022, when you updated that that body of work? Yeah, so back in 2017, um, gosh, what a lot has happened between now and then. Um, but to your point, the the 6% of Fortune 500 companies had a female CEO. Uh, and as you mentioned, just just into just before the new year, that rose to, to 10%, which is, is really exciting and is certainly um, showing progress. Our work back in 2017 was in partnership with the Rockefeller Foundation and collectively they they with us set a goal and their goal was to achieve 100 female CEOs in Fortune 500 companies by 2025. So we're about halfway there Hmm. um, with still a long way to go. Our broader data tells us that globally only about 21% of executive roles are held by women even in industries like ours or retail or the public sector where women make up more than 50% of the workforce. Um, We also have an even further way to go when we think about achieving both gender equality and racial equality. COVID of course has set us back a little bit Mm -hmm. um, with 
over 4% of women globally leaving the workforce. And, and as we know, an even higher percentage within healthcare. I know some data I read recently said over 2 million women in the US alone have exited the workforce. And we really have to make some meaningful decisions to try and bring those people back. There have been some positives, however, that have come out of COVID. We've seen a much greater de degree of flexibility that didn't exist in the past. Uh, we've seen a focus on race as a result of the various social injustices that have occurred. We've seen a rise in conversation around the social determinants of health. And I think importantly, from a leadership perspective, we've seen a change in purpose-driven leadership demonstrated by leaders who operate in an authentic and inclusive way leading with humility, agility, and open-mindedness um, that we haven't always seen. And all, again, interesting qualities that many of our successful female leaders demonstrated in our interviews and assessments back in 2017. One of the other areas of progress, and we're gonna talk a little bit more about women on boards, is the female representation on boards. Mm -hmm. um, 29% of board seats at the S&P 500 companies um, are now women. And in 2016, that was 20%. Um, so we've really seen the movement there. And particularly those women who've been successful at the top directly correlate some of their experience on boards to really setting them up for success. Absolutely. Um, in those top roles. Absolutely. I mean, that's a good, that's a really good, that's a really good backdrop in terms of significant progress and the intentionality from, you know, I think organizations like Rockefeller Foundation sort of nudging this power of nudging and, and really being clear on what success might look like. You know, at the same time, we would all know that there have been some headwinds, right? There have been some places that we've lagged. We've talked about this a little bit leading into this conversation around uh, this gap in advancement, right? So you mentioned 50%, you might, there's the sort of a, a, there's a, there's a gap in terms of female representation in senior management levels, which maybe makes it harder to get to CEO levels. Let's just talk through some of the unintended structural things that we sometimes do that gets in the way of, 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 of people ascending into leadership roles. So what are some of the things that you see as maybe, um, ways that we sort of narrow pipeline to early in careers that maybe make it harder to get this level of a uh, gender diversity and in, in, in CEO roles. Yeah. And, and particularly in healthcare organizations, and I would say even more drastically when we look at um, academic health, we see some real barriers um, often structural actually, which is where we spend a lot of our time really helping organizations see some of the unintended barriers that just have existed for a very long time, whether that be around how long people need to serve in certain roles, how many committees they need to have been on, how many publications need to have mm -hmm. been concluded. All of those are things that really um, impact women in a different way often to men in terms of being able to achieve those goal goals and cause women to have to make those decisions around do I only focus on my career or do I want to focus on a family um, and there are consequences on both sides of that coin in healthcare and women in medicine we work with the Amer American Medical Women's Association who have some really fascinating and upsetting data that shows one in four women in medicine have fertility problems, often because they are waiting mm -hmm. um, and are focused on their careers at the expense often of their own health. Um, I think when we think about what these organizations can do, there's a couple of things in there. Um, Inclusive and equitable hiring practices is almost a no-brainer. Um, you would hope that, that that is the case, still not always the case. Um, intentionality around incentives that are tied to diversity and representation goals. You know, we really believe what gets measured get and paid gets yep, done. That's what matters, yeah. 
um, and many healthcare organizations have kind of talked the talk with that regard, but have stopped short of walking the walk. Um, and I think there's just some real opportunities to remove those structural and unintentional biases that exist. Yeah, and I'll I'll throw out a few others. So a, a big part of what we do at the academy is we we create these fellowship programs that take folks that are a couple of levels away from um, a C-suite position and get them ready. We do this with earlier stage leaders as well. And that comes up a ton, just committee structures, the start time of committee structures. Are they starting at 7 a.m.? right? Yeah. To be a chief or chair, what time is that starting? And does that make it then hard for folks that have responsibilities, maybe on childcare on the front end? So I do think there are these little traps along the way that could be resolved with the right amount of focus and intentionality. And so I just, I appreciate you, you sort of raising that in the backdrop of what we're trying to achieve here. Yeah. So let's go a little bit to the the how the future of the CEO, CEO role has evolved in this time. You've talked about this concept of transform and perform. I'd love for you to bring that to life a bit for our audience. Yeah, of course. Uh, so in this increasingly kind of complex and ambiguous world, um, the world's most successful leaders, we believe, will know how to perform and transform. And what we mean by that is the ability to be running the business and delivering results while driving change and transformation amid uncertainty. Um, and that's really been the world we've all lived in for the last couple of years. Um, we leverage something that we call our enterprise leader framework, which talks about lots of different elements, but four of which I see as being really key are when we think about impact, you know, the what, strategic priorities for running and transforming an organization. I think about capability or the how, those capabilities that drive sustainable results on behalf of an organization. I think about mindset, um, so the who, the beliefs that, that can create a followership, can multiply the capacity to grow um, into as an enterprise leader and be able to pivot between those form and transform dynamics. And then finally, back to, we talked about this earlier, purpose the belief that you have the, the responsibility to transcend self-interests and apply and grow your gifts to give others, to give your organization, to give your communities um, and even the world um, that capability. I love that. Impact, capability, mindset, and purpose. Did I get those four? You did. Okay, Th that's great. Um, what do you note you spend a lot of time, obviously, on the front end of searches and just a lot of time thinking about talent and advising CEOs and board chairs on, on that front. What are you seeing right now as the most common traps? Where are CEOs getting in their own way? Um, I think that CEOs um, not only now have to think about the role of the CEO, but they have to think about the role of their top team in a different way. Um, so we spend a lot of time with boards and CEOs really thinking about the role of that top team and the role of that top team as the team, not as an individual. So you can have you know, an incredible COO or CFO or chief nursing officer, whatever it might be, and they go and, and conduct their individual role incredibly but if as a CEO, you are truly going to be able to find this balance of performing whilst transforming, you are going to have to rely on that top team in a very different way than perhaps you've had to historically. So we spend a lot of time with CEOs thinking about that and thinking beyond one role to that team dynamic. Yeah, I love that. I, I I feel privileged in that I through my role I, I get to spend a lot of time with in, not just health system CEOs but industry company CEOs and and this this notion of you know ensuring that you're not just spending the time on what you like to spend time on what maybe comes easy to you and and really thinking through that that how do I activate the unit towards mission and vision and and all that we're trying to accomplish is is one that. Um, I think a lot of a lot of our our colleagues just talk about and and how that that 
is ever shifting just in terms of this crisis level leadership that's been required of many of us across the last several years. Yeah. So I want to get a little bit more into some of the, the findings in the report around this notion that there is there is no linear path to the CEO position. And, and a lot of the work that you did in this, this work was charting out career paths for the CEOs that you interviewed. What were some of the things that you uncovered on just the pathway? Yeah, so a lot of what we found um, is is kind of what you and I talked about at the beginning of this conversation, that there are hugely varied routes for women who become CEOs. You know, we had such a mix of degrees. You know, did people start in STEM? Did they start in the arts? Um, just hugely varied um, for those women who, who've been successful in becoming CEOs. What was very consistent, however, was that most of these women worked across organizations, taking often lateral as well as promotional roles. And um, many had also worked across different industries. Certainly one of the most common and highly recommended criteria was the, having held PL responsibility um, and often in addition as and as well as operational responsibility. In a number of different scenarios, significant transformation or turnaround experience had been really beneficial. But that PL piece and that operational piece were two areas that were really pretty consistent. Um, the other thing that's interesting, and I think we don't often talk about enough, was that most of these women also re referenced leaders and coaches who played significant roles. Um, and exerted their influence and perspective on the individual's potential. Often, even when they didn't have that belief in themselves, many had never even considered the potential that they could become a CEO until someone else had really pointed that out to them. Um, and I think that's interesting. We, you know, we don't always recognize that uh, as something that can happen and, and the impact we can have on others if we encourage them. Yeah, the power of the nudge. I've I've talked about this in past podcast episodes of how my own career has benefited from people noting your strengths when maybe you don't see it yourself and just opening your aperture yeah. to what you think is possible. And then just what that then means in terms of all of us um, doing the same for others. And that, that can sometimes be in the four walls of your own organization. But oftentimes, I think that your your sponsor or your cabinet can also be helpful to you, even if they're not, you know, sort of directly in your line of sight. Would, would you, did you see it play out that way or any, any change or would you view that differently? No, absolutely. And, and not only is it that support, but also, you know, one of the things that many of these leaders talked about was their network, um, how important their network was both during their growth journey, um, but also really important once they'd got there. A lot of them stressed, don't wait. Don't wait till you get to that top job to try and build that network. You're going to need that net network to help you get there. And then you're going to need that help work to support you once you're there, because that can be a lonely place to be as well. Um, so to your point that when we talk about that network, it is definitely not exclusive to colleagues and peers, that's friends, that's family, that's outside of industry, all of those things. Absolutely. The, I mean, the power of a peer network is incredibly powerful. It's it's a big part of what we believe our mission to be. And I would say, you know, one of one of the things that you sometimes note is it's it's easy to not invest in networks because it's one of those things that might feel important but not urgent. And when yeah. you are, you know, managing a busy life and have a host of operational responsibilities and family, that can be the one thing that I notice for myself that I sometimes sacrifice. But when you do make that shift, it's it's amazing how that opens your eyes to what might be possible. Yeah, couldn't agree more. So let's go a bit to when we talk about progress, there's this, there's this balance between organizational responsibilities. And I think we've covered that, right? Being mindful of uh, things that might be structural that just get in the way of of good people advancing, the need to be oriented around um, just the right level of conversation and maybe even tying some performance measurement against that. So that we, I think we've covered the organizational responsibilities in terms yeah. of ensuring advancement. Would you add anything else to the organizational side? And then I want to go to what, what individuals themselves can do, but anything else on the organizational side? 
Yeah, I think a couple of things. Um, so I think it, it it starts early. You know, how do we get to to our future healthcare leaders in early education? Help them learn about the potential roles. I think you mentioned this when we have them. How do we support them? How do we make sure we have a robust, safe working environment where people can thrive? And we talked about the career career pathways or the rock walls. I think a couple of things that we didn't mention earlier is we desperately need, and particularly in healthcare, more mental health support um, for our people. Mm -hmm. And that's, you know, women, men, everybody. Uh, we need to make that a less taboo subject. Again, there's been an awful lot of research and, and AMWAR in particular have focused on some of the challenges that exist around things like if you're applying for your license and it asks, have you ever sought help for mental health? Um, that many people are not seeking that help because they're nervous about selecting that box. And we've seen Absolutely. some of the consequences of that happening. So I think, again, there are some of those kind of older unintended consequences that exist. We have to do a better job recognizing some of those barriers. Um, and then the final thing that we haven't talked about yet is we've got to address the pay gap. Um, it is still there, it is profound, and we have to tackle it. I think that's perfectly said. I don't have anything to add to that. Um, I, I do want to go to maybe the then the individual piece, right? So, so and, and this is probably not easy to encapsulate into one or two things, but if you were to offer advice for women leaders that are aspiring to be in a CEO position, what would you offer them? Yeah, so I think we we just mentioned it, tap into that strong network of mentors, sponsors, colleagues, leaders, and friends, create those connections, find an organization that will support your career trajectory. Don't waste time if it's pretty obvious that that's not going to be where you are. Um, take action despite your fear. Um, you've got to leverage resilience. I think women have more of that than anyone. <laughs> Lead with purpose. We've talked about how important that purpose piece is. Um, recognize that actually your strength isn't in having all the answers all the time. Uh, and it's back to that piece around building a team around you that is going to enable an organization. This None of this can ever be on one person anymore. And then finally, be kind to yourself. I think we expect an yeah. awful lot of ourselves. Make sure that you are taking that time to, to look after yourself and be kind. Yeah, I, I love all of that. I, I also think, and a big reason why I sought you out to join us here is I, I think increasingly we are... Uh, seeing exemplars and just more examples of folks that are, you know, that, that, uh, that look like us in these positions. And I, I just, from my own reflection, I was about five years ago and I was at a retreat um, with another company. It was, I was a chief talent officer at the time. And I was invited to this retreat, which included the top positions across a set of portfolio companies. And it was a mix of roles. Um, and there were three women CEOs running these, these portfolio companies. And this was only five years ago. I'd actually never been in a room with a woman CEO before then. And when I was interacting with them and just getting to know them, the the first thought that I had to myself was like, wow, I think maybe I could do this. It hadn't even occurred to me <laughs> before yeah. then. Um, I had my head down. I had, you know, I was doing all the things, um, really trying to be helpful to the organization. And I loved the talent portfolio that I was leading as a chief talent officer, but it had never even occurred to me that that was something I should aspire to. So a big part of, you know, for, for me, the purpose of this conversation is just there's a great body of work. There's lots of different proof points of how people have done it. And I think sometimes the first thing is just the awareness that that is something that, you know, you you could and ought to be um, ambitious and, and really try to try to achieve. So I, I appreciate yeah. your some of your practical elements as well. Yeah. All right. So maybe our final question, um, mm -hmm. although I could just go on and on about this topic. I think uh, if I ever had another job, it might be to do some of what, you, what you're doing, which is live and breathe in the the, the talent uh, and human capital <laughs> space because it's so fascinating to me. Yeah. But I'll ask maybe one final question. If you could invite any two people um, to your table to continue this conversation, um, who would they be and why? 
Wow, that's a great question. Yeah. Um, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I have two people in mind. One is particularly topical. Um, Jacinda Ardern, the the former uh, Prime Minister of New Zealand. I have been inspired by her for a couple of years. I've really enjoyed watching her lead and her style. Um, and I read one of her quotes just a week or so ago, which was really interesting to me. She said, one of the criticisms I've faced over the years is that I'm not aggressive enough or assertive enough, or maybe somehow because I'm empathetic, it means I'm weak. I totally rebel against that. I refuse to believe that you cannot be both compassionate and strong. Um, and I thought it was such mm. a, a fantastic quote to your point around being in a room and experiencing other women and women CEOs being inspirational. I would tell you kind of the flip of that that has been interesting for me in my career is I've met some incredible women leaders and certainly people who I aspire to. But I've also met a lot of women leaders who have um, been successful and perhaps made it to the top, but have had to had to do it in a way that I think has been against some of those morals and values and ability to be supportive of people because they felt the only way to get there was to behave a certain way. Interesting. I certainly, the scarcity mindset in some ways. Yeah. 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 And I, I hope that that is changing. I believe you can absolutely be who you are and be successful. Um, but we do still live in a world sometimes where sometimes I think women think they've got to behave like a man to, to get that job. And I hope that we can get rid of that soon. Um, the other person I'd love to have at my table, and maybe it's, this is a, um, a funny one, just based on, on where I'm from, but would be the queen. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I would love to have a cup of tea with her, but I just think as a female leader, she is one of the most exemplary examples that sits out there. She, she led by example for an incredibly long time with amazing poise. Uh, she had respect for everybody she encountered. She was hardworking. Um, she embraced change. She had amazing curiosity. Uh, and ultimately, she, she had a purpose and duty and a commitment to service that was unlike anything I've ever seen. So they would be my two people. That would be, so Jacinda and the Queen, that would be a, a fa <laughs> <laughs> lots of stories and a, a fascinating set of conversations for sure. <laughs> Well, Liz, it's been so lovely to chat with you. I hope this won't be the last time. And I, I appreciate the work that you're doing and um, and keep helping us with these rocks in the ocean. I think uh, if we're going to move healthcare, it's going to be through the, the talent webs that we create. So we appreciate your work on that front. Thank you so much. A pleasure to be here. You too. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thanks for joining me at the table with Renee De Silva, a podcast brought to you by the Health Management Academy. I hope you enjoyed this episode, and if you did, subscribe and drop us a review on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you're listening to this podcast now. For all of our episodes, including show notes and transcripts, and more information about how you might join me at the table in the future, please head to hmacademy.com slash podcast. I look forward to having you back at my table next time. Talk to you again soon.